Two taboos in polite conversation have traditionally been talking about religion and talking about politics. People get immediately heated, and it often isn't conducive to a pleasant, conflict-free encounter. So it's easy to make a new friend and have no idea there's some kind of political disagreement between the two of you. But if you take an interest in politics, and if you clicked on this video, odds are you do, it's something that will likely come up eventually. And suddenly this blissful ignorance of your friendship fades away, and you have to look at the reality of your friendship in the eye. In the past few years, friendships being damaged by political differences has become a recurring topic in news media, and we often see media figures opining about political opinions costing them friends. In many cases, it's easy to feel sympathy for someone who has lost a friend, or understanding when a person expresses anxiety as to why they keep their political affiliations hidden. But not all complaints about friendships being affected by politics are the same. The rules for friendships vary, and I want to look at how these dynamics shift, both for friendships in private and for those of us who have friendships in public. In recent years, polling has shown people are increasingly less likely to have friends with different political persuasions. According to a YouGov poll of American citizens, all three categories of voters, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, have become less likely to be friends with anyone who has different political opinions, with Democrats showing the biggest change from 2016 to 2020. A Pew Research poll changed the question slightly, instead asking supporters from each respective side in the previous federal election if they have a few or no friends who supported the opposite candidate. Once again, both sides revealed very few of their friends supported the other's candidate, if any at all. In the UK, a similar poll was conducted by Ipsos, and the results were similar, although this one dug a little deeper. Much like the American polls, it showed that both the left and right found it difficult to be friends with someone who had a different political affiliation, with those supporting the left-wing Labour Party having more difficulty in being friends with those in the right-wing Conservative Party. When digging into this particular poll, though, the numbers reveal something interesting. The propositions asked on specific issues revealed that these divides are on significant issues that are more than mere disagreements on public policy. For example, participants were asked to agree or disagree with these two propositions. It would be hard to be friends with someone who supports the expansion of transgender rights in the UK. And it would be hard to be friends with someone who thinks transgender rights have gone too far in the UK. It's a much deeper question than asking what someone thinks is the appropriate tax rate. Since 2015, reports of transphobic hate crimes have quadrupled. According to Gallup, one in four trans people have been threatened with or experienced transphobic violence. One in three UK employers are less likely to employ a trans person. Almost half of trans people have a suicide attempt in their past. So the state of trans rights in the UK are not great. Considering that the question in the Ipsos poll reveals not just someone's attitude towards friendships across political lines, but how the assumption of political affiliation carries with it an attitude towards the rights of trans people. If someone believes trans rights have gone too far, it's a question that goes beyond politics, and it's the realm of whether or not you believe someone has the right to publicly identify as the gender they understand themselves to be. We can try to intellectualize this in terms of it being a debate, and some people might enjoy doing that. It may be easy enough for a cis person to be friends with someone who believes trans rights have gone too far, even if it means constantly getting into arguments. But for a trans person, these arguments can hit a lot harder when it's your own rights being debated. And there's so many other degrees of differences, such as a cis person who might be more passionate about trans rights because a sister or brother is trans, or perhaps a trans person who can compartmentalize well enough to engage in that debate. But in the midst of all this rhetorical exercise, it should be understood that what's being debated here are the rights of human beings, and that this debate being politicized doesn't make it the same as other debates on policy issues. This is much like debates around marriage equality, civil rights, voting rights, and an endless number of issues that have been politicized both in the past and present. Someone who advocates against trans rights is, whether they know it or not, advocating for bigotry. While someone can choose to be friends with a bigot in their personal life, reducing this disagreement to a political one is disingenuous. That isn't to say all disagreements across political affiliations are questions of personal rights, but considering what sort of issues get politicized, I think it's an important distinction to make. Amidst all these discussions about friendships being affected by politics, disagreements on issues like this reveal something far deeper is at play. In late 2020, the New York Times asked students about relationships with people who have differing political opinions. Here are a few of the responses. Some people that believe that politics shouldn't ruin relationships don't realize that at times, not caring about politics is a privilege. If my friends or family members have huge differences in opinions from me, for example, if they don't support Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ+, and women's rights, etc., then I don't want to associate myself with them at all. That is more than just politics. It's about people's basic human rights. People's lives are more important than relationships. 
As a queer woman, hearing that one of my friends supports Trump means that they support all the discrimination and laws he has enacted against the LGBTQIA plus community, as well as women, people of color, Native Americans, disabled people, etc. Usually, if they're a friend, I open a dialogue and talk about my beliefs often with them, trying to get them to understand what the facts are, what the other side is, and why I feel that way. If they're family, I tend to avoid them when I can. If they change their mind and admit that supporting someone who doesn't see me as a human being is wrong, then I will continue to have that relationship with them. If they can't or refuse to listen, then our relationship will die. I can't respect someone who doesn't respect me. Whatever the response is determines how our relationship changes, whether we drift apart or grow closer together. What I liked about these particular quotes is how they establish the importance of the type of relationship being considered. Not all friendships are equal, and a relationship with a family member is often much more meaningful than a friendship. In those cases, it becomes a real test as to how to maintain that relationship. Opinions like these certainly aren't universal. In the same article, some students offer different responses. In my family, my father is a Republican and my mother is a Democrat, but my parents have learned to not judge each other because of their political beliefs, but to accept each other's opinions and be grateful they are able to agree to disagree. This election was a great test for this way of thinking. Biden came out victorious. My father accepts that and moves on. As simple as that sounded, it taught me something that I will use when I start to build important relationships with people. Don't judge people based on their political opinions or their opposing opinions. Judge them for what they mean to you. I actually think it's not important in the slightest to have similar political beliefs to your friends and family. Rather, I think it's important to have different beliefs and opinions in order to gain perspective and educate yourself. I come from an extremely divided family where my parents are extremely Republican. One sister is extremely liberal. The other is fairly moderate, and I am moderate, leaning towards the left side. Although our disagreements can get frustrating and feelings can be hurt, I am thankful that I am able to have all perspectives and educate myself to the best of my ability in order to create my own political beliefs and not just choose my position based on those who surround me. The real disparity between these attitudes regarding the intersection of friendship and politics is not so much the idea of valuing one over the other, but rather what some one considers a political question. Speaking to The Atlantic, Emily Van Dyne, a communication professor at the University of Illinois, said, Politics isn't just politics anymore. Political identity now encompasses so many other things. Our social identity, our morals, our values. A casual friend whose incessant political rants may be easy enough to cut out of your life, but it's a bit tougher when it's a parent who regularly complains about immigrants. Some relationships can be formed around disagreement or argument, though this can sometimes reflect the stakes in the relationship. If politics are impacting how we form friendships, it might be worth stepping back to take a look at how much value one places in that particular friendship. Writing for Psychology Today, professor of psychology at George Mason University, Todd B. Kashtan, outlines some basics of friendship. 1. There is a goal of pleasure. There is an expectation that both parties enjoy each other's company and show relatively equal amounts of appreciation and enjoyment. 2. There is a sense of duty. There is an expectation that you will act in your friend's interests without being forced to, without being told to, without being accountable. 3. There is a high level of empathy. There is an expectation that both parties will try to understand each other's perspective. You will not always agree, but you put in the work to understand who they are, where their motivations lie, and attempt to seek agreement when discord arises. While not all friendships possess all three qualities, they typically have at least two. He then goes on. If you fear losing a friend or creating a turmoil in a relationship when being true to yourself, then your relationship lacks two of the three features of a firm foundation. Duty is missing. Empathy is missing. A solid friendship does not exist. When you are unable to reveal honest thoughts and feelings, then it becomes increasingly improbable that a solid friendship could even form. Although the article goes on to decry outspoken political testing as a means of determining one's friends, the passage above does suggest that friendships, at least the more meaningful ones, typically have an openness and honesty that would include not hiding one's politics. So how does one navigate a friendship with someone who has different politics? A number of articles have been produced exploring this very question. If you've decided that this relationship is one you want to maintain, a recurring theme is to engage calmly and with an attempt to understand the other side. Research has shown that taking the perspective of the person you're talking to can lead to a greater understanding of their position. One exercise that's recommended is trying to write a narrative from the perspective of the other person. This can help create some empathy and lead to more productive conversations. Listening and keeping a calm head can have a similar impact. It also helps to give someone room to be more complex. One bad political take may not mean someone can be easily slotted into a disastrous political position. There's also the very simple solution of just not talking about politics, making it one of those topics you simply don't touch with that person. Like avoiding mentioning multi-level marketing scams around your Uncle Kevin so you can avoid another sales pitch. 
Everyone has to make choices for themselves as to what political lines they're okay with their friends being on. And while I encourage people to consider their choices carefully and not let themselves be trapped in a friendship that harms them or discard one based on minor differences, I think it's better to reserve judgment when it comes to who anyone chooses to be friends with in private, particularly if that person is a stranger. So if you're someone in that position, I don't think it's fair for anyone who doesn't know you to judge you on who you choose to be friends with. I would just express that I hope this friendship is something that makes you a more fulfilled person. This same outlook does not hold for public figures, though. With all the groundwork of discussing star-crossed political friendships in the real world, let's now shift to something completely ridiculous. The world of online personalities. I'm sure everyone watching this has seen at least one video about parasocial relationships. That is, the relationship between a content creator, like me, and my audience. But what about the interplay between two different content creators? Or for our purposes, two content creators who engage in political commentary on different sides of the political spectrum. There are a couple of different ways political commentators typically interact with one another here on YouTube. For video essayists, such as myself, you often see other commentators make guest appearances, typically reading quotes or excerpts from source material. I've had people do them for me, and I've done more of them than I can count for other people. Attention all trespassers! I am the Supreme Serpent! Less common is the collaboration. Two or more creators work on a video or videos that are available for one or more of their respective channels. I don't do much of these myself, though I recently worked on one with Mexi about a very special babysitting club. We didn't discuss Stacy all that much mm. in this video. Mm -hmm. Well, there's what is there to say, really? She's from New York. She has diabetes. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's all you need to know about Stacy. You might also see two creators interacting on a stream. This is where things get a bit more complicated, as there are a lot of ways this can go down. Someone might appear as part of a panel, it might be a one-on-one -on -one chat, sometimes it can be confrontational. I don't stream too much myself, so I have less experience with this one, but here's an example of what streams are like. Apparently it's woke He-Man and everybody's mad. Mm. Man, if is Jose old enough to remember He-Man? Uh, no, but is did they finally make him gay in the new one? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of YouTube, you might see creators interact in other mediums, like Twitter, like when I make a sick dunk and people acknowledge my brilliance. There are even some very rare moments when content creators beat in the real world as part of a public-facing event. As an example, in Toronto, myself and some other political content creators have hosted meetups where we interact with members of our audience. A fun bit of Jose trivia is that at the last one we did, that was in February 29th of 2020, I recorded the opening moments to my Married with Children video. Friends, I'm gonna need a boost to get through this video. Can I get a whoa, Jose? Whoa! Okay, so those are five different examples of how content creators on YouTube interact. And there's one thing to varying degrees they all have in common. They are all performative. Let me clarify what I mean by performative. I don't mean presenting some kind of false front. Many of these moments can be authentic. Rather, I mean these appearances are done very much with the knowledge that they are in front of an audience. Some of these may or may not be actual friendships people are witnessing. What they do have the appearance, though, is of a friendly relationship between the people in question. To someone in the audience, they are watching a performance of friendship. When someone makes a decision to appear on another person's video or stream, or engages with them on social media or in the real world, it's with the awareness that people are paying attention to how they interact. Displays of kindness or hostility signal to the audience what sort of relationship these people have, and to some degree will inform that audience on how to engage with this other creator's content. For instance, if I have someone to a guest voice on my channel, it signifies to my audience that this is another creator I approve of, and that perhaps they should give this person's content a chance. On the other hand, if I reply to a tweet telling someone that they're clueless and should try washing their disgusting beanie, it signals to my audience that this is a person you probably shouldn't listen to. A lot of this plays on the parasocial relationships that are formed by people watching online content. Just to quickly sum up, a parasocial relationship is a one-way relationship in which a viewer feels attached to a presenter who has no knowledge of the viewer's personal life. Even though it's only one way, to someone watching it can feel like they have a virtual friend. When it comes to if you are watching these performative friendships, it gets more complicated. It's like being in a parasocial relationship with multiple people. Or in other words, it's like being in a parasocial friend group. This is a pattern we've already seen on the right wing on YouTube. Repega Lewis's alternative influence paper demonstrated how different creators appearing on different platforms can create a shared audience. With the assistance of the YouTube algorithm, the impact becomes even greater. As much as we might like to pretend we as content creators exist on our sole little islands, not connected to anyone else, we all have audiences that overlap. 
And a paper like this is a reminder that we exist in community structures and that there are very real risks of radicalization, not just of our audiences, but of our own content. And who you choose to befriend on your channel pushes your audience, and sometimes your content, in certain political directions. While not all creators are necessarily conscious of this performance, although some certainly are, the results to the audience are the same. Positive interactions encourage an audience to be more positive to the person being interacted with, and negative ones do the opposite. When we step into the world of friendships across the political aisle, we can see how this becomes more complicated for anyone engaging in political commentary online. If someone is on the left and supposedly championing left-wing ideas or policies and then publicly engages in a friendly way with someone on the right, a performance of friendship, it can signal to their audience that this person should be considered positively as well. And if this behavior becomes a pattern, it can be counterproductive to whatever left-wing goals the commentator has in mind. This isn't to say someone on the left should never be friendly with someone on the right, but it's important to consider the broader social context of these interactions. If I were to appear on the channel of someone I disagree with, that could present a shift in the algorithm, one that's more powerful than the luck of one of my videos showing up as a recommendation. But as lovely as it may be for everyone to stop watching PragerU and instead one of my videos, it can backfire as well. Let's use a recent example. Figures supposedly on the left, such as Jimmy Dore and Glenn Greenwald, have regularly appeared on Tucker Carlson's program over the years having friendly, cordial interviews. This type of interaction is complicated as there is value in grabbing the attention of a right-wing audience and steering them towards your left-wing content. But when your supposed left-wing content largely consists of ignoring the right and attacking the party that's to the left of them, perhaps in an effort to satisfy this right-wing audience that has been introduced to you in a friendly manner, you have to ask the question what sort of project this is furthering. You can claim you're not trying to help the right, but this display of friendship and absence of right-wing critique ends up with clips like these. Fascism is a very real danger. There was nothing that occurred like January 6th in the history of the uh, United States. Oh, so ex except Jerry, <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> fascism is from the left and the right in America. The, the, no, are you, are you kidding that Joe fascism. Biden isn't a fascist? Well, I can't say I know the metrics of Jimmy Dore's channel. I'd wager he has a higher percentage of people who enjoy Tucker Carlson than mine or most other left-wing channels. And I suspect they aren't going there to hear Jimmy Dore's left-wing ideals, but rather to see him beat up on their political rivals, the Democrats. Being friendly on someone else's platform while still producing content that makes clear that someone is not a part of the right would complicate someone's public profile. And I'm not going to pretend I understand the most effective way to thread that political needle. But in many cases, if someone is invited onto another platform, friendly conversation typically implies friendly content. Frequently, you might see a commentator lament that they are being critiqued for their associations, and no one should ever be written off for one association or appearance or other incident without comparing it to their full body of work. But when it becomes a pattern and is reflected in their content, it brings into question how committed someone is to whatever political affiliation they claim to have. It also displays a stunning ignorance, as if this is just a question about private friendships. The details about cross-political friendships I outlined for private people is still true for anyone with a public profile. Just because someone has a YouTube channel doesn't give anyone the right to judge or police their private life. But when those relationships are with a content creator who has a public profile, they need to be aware that who they engage with on friendly terms sends a message to their audience, whether they want it to or not, and whether they think it should or not. If I started live streaming with, for example, Alex Jones, and we were chummy and cordial, or if I had him read some quotations for one of my videos, and never challenged him on his ridiculous conspiracy theories, it would, to varying degrees, signal to my audience that I think Alex Jones is someone who can be welcomed into public discourse, and that his ideas may not be as toxic to the public square as they are. And that would work directly against my own goals of pointing out how certain commentators should never be taken seriously. And in the case of Alex Jones, listening to him to learn about the world is a waste of time and brain cells. And I feel like I have to say this again, I'm not saying one should never be friendly with someone who disagrees with you politically. If there was a moderate conservative who disagreed with me on some issue such as whether or not healthcare should cover dental, that's someone I wouldn't be too bothered being friendly with in public in a performative way. But by being friendly with someone who spreads racist pseudoscience or climate change denialism or is just a complete asshole, I would be signaling to my audience that their presence in the political discourse, and by extension their extreme content, should be considered to some degree acceptable. And that's not something I'm going to do. If you enjoyed this video, you can support this channel by becoming a patron or member. You'll get your name in the credits, early access to videos, and a download link to my theme songs. If you'd like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Thank you all so much for watching.